Hello, welcome to another uh, live skill tutorial. Today we're going to talk about setting up a pulse laser dial. <coughs> First, we'll talk about uh, quickly how laser dials work and some of the specifics about them, different types. We'll talk about how you can use a phase locked loop as an adjustable clock at a program one on FPGA. And then we'll talk about uh, what is gain switching the laser and how you can use it to make a very fast pulse laser dial. So a laser dial, electrically, is, is very similar to a normal diode. And uh, for lasers, the way you pump it to get population inversion is via the ejection current into the diode. The optical power is proportional to the current, not the voltage through the diode. And there is a threshold current above which below which you'll get no laser light. And there are a, a number of different types of semiconductor data lasers. There are edge emitters, surface emitters, distributed bright reflectors, and so on. Okay, so you can um, use a function generator to run a laser diode in uh, pulsed operation. But let's say you don't have a function generator, or you don't want to buy a very expensive function generator. You can also use a phase locked loop, which is a frequency synthesizer. So in essence, what we have here is a feedback loop on a frequency variable oscillator. So this variable oscillator here um, is controlled by its input, and through several different functions, you can change that input so that your output clock, with respect to this input clock, is uh, it's phase stable, but you can change the frequency, you can add a phase shift, you can change the duty cycle, you can make the frequency smaller or bigger. There's a lot of control here to generate a uh, different clock signal from your original one. So, you can buy uh, phase lock loops on their own, but they come standard on FPGAs. The, uh, this little FPGA demo boards here, they're uh, available for a good price, and they have a lot of other functions on them, so you can use this to control an experiment and uh, add a bunch of other functionality to control other parts of your experiment if you wanted to. Additionally, you could add a microprocessor on the, on the FPGA. And uh, if you're unfamiliar with FPGAs, there are two main uh, languages that are used to code FPGAs. And here are some suggestions for two textbooks that you can uh, use to learn these languages. So to program an FPGA, you need um, several resources. One is the uh, code from the board uh, site where you have a demo code and specifications of your specific board that houses the FPGA. And then also you're going to need the uh, programming development environment. environment. Uh, in this case, for using a uh, uh, Intel FPGA, we use Cordis. So after you go through the instructions to create your project, going to need to make sure to pick the right FPGA, and this is written on the FPGA and will be in the manual and such. Um, using the resources provided, there will be a uh, demo code where uh, you have projects that are already written up for you. You're going to need to make sure to import the QSF file so that you have the inputs and outputs on this specific FPGA board. And this allows access to the clock, to various I.O. pins, and um, it tells the uh, FPGA software what exact pin on the FPGA corresponds to this various accessory that you need to access. So now that you've done that, you can create your very simple uh, main module where you have your inputs from your pin assignments or your outputs have some local variables, and then you'll have your uh, phase
phase lock loop uh, function. At this point, you're going to create your phase lock loop. You're going to uh, go to the intellectual property catalog and open up the GUI for a phase lock loop. This allows you, the first screen allows you to set up what is your input clock. And then you can go to a few screens later where you can fully specify the settings for your output clock. Uh, you can make up to four of these in, in most of these demo ports. And you can also have the settings of the phase lock loop be reconfigurable without having to reprogram the FPGA. Uh, this will enable uh, more function inputs that you can adjust with other uh, uh, code or other accessories on the FPGA. Uh, finally, you will need to uh, make sure that you add in the phase lock loop code and you'll want to compile it and make sure that you get all these screen check marks, everything squares out. If you have any issues, uh, refer to the, uh, code, the code manuals for these various FPGA languages. To program it, make sure you have the uh, USB install, uh, drivers installed, that the hardware is set up, and that you're programming in JTAG. Additionally, make sure you're using the SOF file and that the target device is the same serial number as, as your device. After you have all that set up, then you can start the program and it should load on and be successful. So quick troubleshooting. Again, if you have any syntax errors, um, system Verilog is what's used in Cordis, so refer to that textbook. The uh, demo board will have all the specifics on your peripherals that you need, so refer to those resources. If the USB blaster is not showing up in this hardware box, uh, most likely you didn't install the driver, or the driver, uh, or Windows doesn't know where the driver files are, so you need to manually point to where the drivers are. So now we're gonna go to the second half, where we talk about what is a gain switch laser and why you would want to use one. So when you current module a, a normal diode, you're limited by the bandwidth of the diode's electrical response. And this puts a bound on how uh, sharp of an optical laser pulse you can get with this diode. But with gain switching, this allows uh, production of much shorter optical pulses than are possible with uh, current modulation. This also enables a fast pulse laser with a very customizable repetition rate. And this is in contrast to mode locked lasers where the repetition rate is uh, very fixed and dependent on the geometry of the cavity. Uh, now you might ask, with these nice properties, why isn't everybody gain switching? Um, there are some drawbacks. Because the light only goes through a few round trips in the cavity, there are fluctuations in some of the uh, components of the laser beam, and for certain experiments, those are not tolerable. So gain switching is this phenomena where if you have a uh, bias current going through the diode where you have some carriers and it's below the lasing threshold, then if you apply a short current pulse, this will raise the current density, and it will raise it above the threshold and then as population inversion happens and you get lasing, you will get a uh, short optical pulse at which time the current shuts off and so it will not uh, continue. Uh, if you want to refer, if you want to learn more about the specific dynamics of the electron hole pairs and the photons in uh, such a laser while you're gain switching, I refer you to this paper. Um, some things to notice, um, all of these pulses that you would create with a gain switch laser are independent, so you're very flexible on the repetition rate, um, and the optical pulse is much shorter than the current pulse that you put in. 
so here's a simple schematic for a circuit to gain switch laser. You have your laser diode here, and you have a bias T here, and this allows you to put an RF signal in and a DC bias in. This DC bias is used to provide some uh, injector, some current carriers into the diode, and then this RF signal allows you to bring the uh, diode over the lasing threshold and then back under to achieve this current pulse here. So here are some uh, specif spe rough specifications for uh, parameters that you might want to use to get uh, the gain switch switching to occur. You roughly need to match the uh, impedance of the laser diode. And uh, one thing to note is you want your bias to be adjustable. And this allows you to tune um, the pulses. So with this tunable bias, you're going to want to tune it up from zero. And you will see that as you tune it, the gain switching pulses start very low, and they'll grow higher and broader. And then eventually, you will uh, see multiple of these low pulses. And this is related to spiking, which is a phenomena seen when laser cavities are turned on. And there's a relaxation oscillation that occurs. And uh, if you turn on the current pulse for long enough, you can see several of these relaxation oscillations. Okay, so here's some tips to help you to be able to verify this and to make sure everything's working right. Um, remember that you're going to need a photodiode with a high enough bandwidth to actually see these pulses. If the um, pulses that you expect are below your bandwidth and you measure a, uh, an optical pulse with a detector equal to the bandwidth of your detector, then you know that the pulse is that size or smaller. Remember that with these frequencies are in the gigahertz range, you're going to need transmission lines and you're going to need to use uh, discrete components that have enough bandwidth. So often, um, surface mount components are going to be necessary. Additionally, uh, one of the nice things about gain switching is it's not necessary to use a uh, fast pulse laser, one that is uh, designed for pulses, as most laser diodes aren't. This phenomena is a uh, non-layer phenomena that takes advantage of uh, inherent dynamics in almost all laser diodes, so you can use standard laser diodes to gain switch. Okay, in conclusion, uh, phase locked loops on FPGAs can provide a very flexible platform to drive a pulsed laser source, and if you have very strict requirements for the timing of your pulses, gain switching a laser diode can provide uh, very sharp pulses for your experiment. Thank you.